Good afternoon. I'm here with Michael Snyder. He is the commissioner of the Vermont Forest Parks and Forest and Parks and Forest Parks and Recreation. And Recreation. There you go. <laughs> All right. I got it. And he's just written this book called Wood Wise, Woods Wise. And we're really excited because we like to spend a lot of time in the woods and we thought this would be a fun spring interview to do. So thanks so much for coming, Michael. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. How did you become commissioner of Forest Parks and Recreation? Well, that's, uh, that's an appointed position by the governor. Uh, governor Scott uh, reappointed me uh, when he came into office and after I had served for three terms under Governor Shumlin, who first appointed me in uh, 2011. And um, that happened, uh, I came to that position after, after having worked in the department as a county forester right here in Chenin County for uh, about 14 years. Uh, and then was promoted to commissioner in 2011, been here since. So how, did, how is that transition for you from being a forester to being a head administrator? Well, it's a, it's a big change. Uh, I'd like to think that I'm still a forester because I'm super into that, and, uh, but it has changed in the way I do it, uh, the, what I do. Um, but uh, it's mostly, uh, it's a significant change. Whereas I was a county forester working with private landowners, giving technical assistance into towns and communities working with school groups. It was a day-to-day, -day, a lot of time outdoors, interacting um, in the woods with people. And this is um, decidedly lacking in tree time. Yeah, this is more uh, meetings and, uh, as you say, ad administering. And so, you know, I've had a, a, a career that's been in the woods in forest science, forest management. Forest policy, I think, at its best, would try to combine forest science and forest management. And so that's kind of an interesting opportunity I have is to, um, uh, spent some part of my career trying to do forest policy by, again, integrating forest management, the realities of life interacting with the planet, uh, and science, forest science, and understanding of the planet, particularly forested parts. And where did your love for the forest and the outdoors come from? Well, I think it's been there all along. I mean, sometimes I joke or like, I think I must have been born this way. It's earliest memories, just really liking to be outside. I think associations with people who were and worked outside. And then a really notable experience around the time when I realized you have to grow up at some point and have a job. Uh, I was lucky enough to meet a forester and he was amazing. He had, well, he had a cool truck and he had the vest with all the gear and the measuring devices and he knew so much and had this easy way in the woods that I just thought, you mean you can do that? I'm doing that, and I set out to do that. And uh, we took every class that was related, went to UVM Forestry School, um, and have worked in forest, forestry in a variety of different ways ever since. So it's just uh, I'm lucky to have found something that I really love personally, and uh, in so many ways that you can actually make a career and a living doing it in a variety of different ways. And I would encourage young people to think about that because I don't know that it's really well known that it's possible to have a really great life uh, in the woods or related to the woods. Mm -hmm. What are the biggest threats that the Vermont woods face? Well, we're lucky to be so heavily forested uh, in the state. About three quarters of the state is forested and we get a lot of benefit from that. Um, but And it's largely in really good shape. Uh, fairly healthy. There are health threats to forest health that are natural cyclic occurring threats. Forests have evolved with them. That's really, those aren't the really scary threats. But we have some new kinds of threats. Um, so uh, invasive plants, pests, pests and pathogens, notably the emerald ash borer is a great example, more recent, um, uh, which threatens to kill ash trees. It kills ash trees and it's uh, devastating in other states. And ash is a relatively small but significant part of Vermont's forested ecosystem and losing it is a real problem and um, that's one example of kind of the changing landscape and globalization uh, and a variety of those kind of forest health threats uh, and I think threats to um, the culture of people living with and working with forests is another big one and a, and a threat of conversion of forest to non-forest um, those are the big ones uh, f frankly and what is that conversion rate in Vermont? We're three-quarter forested, but how much are we digging into that forest? Um, not all that much, if, you know, in gross terms, which is really good news. Um, but, and, and we've had a history of people working with forests going all the way back to the first European contact. It was largely forested. It's kind of the original native Vermonters of forests uh, and the things that live in forests. And um, human settlement kind of 
contained in waterways and relatively small, but then people doing subsistence agriculture and then bigger agriculture, uh, you know, in the peaking in land clearing in the early to mid 1800s, and then uh, a couple of waves of regeneration, regrowth, and cutting since, right? So uh, um, we had this long history, um, and in the sort of modern history, say in the 1900s to present, we've enjoyed an aggrading, growing, expanding forest. And for the first time in a hundred years, a few years ago, there was a documented change where we're actually losing forest land. And I think it's about 70,000 acres was the estimate over a 10 year, the last 10 year measurement period. Uh, and so that's not huge. And it's definitely not cause for like the sky is falling, but I think it says something that for the when you start going the other way after a hundred years of growing and expanding in area and age and size, uh, that is uh, it's sort of saying, well, I think it's called, it's, it's asked us, it's suggested we should probably pay attention, and many people are, and thinking about how do we continue the benefits we have from a forested landscape, ecological, cultural, economic, they're significant, and we want to keep that going, and so we're trying to have a more int intentional approach about planning for human habitation and growth in a way that is that that can work with um, large continuous contiguous blocks of forests and connected areas um, and healthy forests and um, and that's going to take a mix of approaches and I believe strongly that it includes people being connected to the land mm -hmm. through working forests uh, good silviculture and logging and outdoor recreation just people being part of the forest and kind of holding it all together using wood locally and being proud of it so you wrote this book, I think, as a way to educate the community about forests, right, and their value and how to live in them? I think so. I, I'd hope to think that's a big part of it. I mean, it, it's probably worth telling. The book came about, uh, it is a compilation of essays that I wrote over many years, mostly as county forester, as kind of an outreach tool to, based on questions I would get from actual Vermont landowners. Um, uh, Northern Woodlands Magazine was good enough to give me a, a place, one page in every issue, to kind of address these landowner questions under a heading called Woodswise. Uh, and I did that for, I guess, 17 years. And this is a collection of 63 of those essays um, that reflect interest from people in answer, addressing their questions. All along, it was about trying to help people connect and putting it together and having it, you know, more available, I think, is still in that same vein. We're thrilled to have it out there and hope people will enjoy it as a, as a gateway to a lot more. So if you were to categorize the, the, the categories of questions in this book, how do they fall? They're, they're heavy to three subject areas, which reflects my personal interest, in, which is about forest management, silviculture, and logging, and how do you choose, and which ones, and why, and how do you do it right? Uh, there's a lot of questions and, and answers about those kind of topics and, 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 and a whole lot about how do forests work, how do trees grow, and why do they do this, and why do they look like that, which is, uh, I think helps people get to know forests in another way and to realize there's so much that we know through really fascinating science done in some cases by people right here in Vermont, UVM, uh, the Proctor Maple Research Center, you know, uh, on and on, uh, and that we know a lot. It's really good to know a lot. It's, it helps us do, do things and manage and live and coexist better. And then there's also all this wonderful mystery, and I, I even say magic, that, that remains, that we can't explain it all. And I think that's pretty fun, too. Because I think some, you, you know, new people will come along with different perspectives, different experiences, and we'll leave some things for them to answer. So when you come into the woods, it's springtime, it's beautiful, you know, everything's alive, and you walk into a woods, how do you, what do you look for? How do you read the environment? How do you tell that things are thriving, the natural world is thriving or not? All of it. And at the risk of turning people off by sort of saying, oh, you have to know everything, because uh, you really don't, I think it is all about sort of seeing the whole thing and that it's, 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 there's parts and there's pieces and there's processes, and you try to see it all and as much as you can and look for clues everywhere you can. There's obvious, there's less obvious. Um, so for me, that's something that I take maybe most pride in and as personally as, as professional as being a forester is that I think foresters uh, have to integrate so much of the nat physical features of a place, slope, steepness, soil type, um, 
on and on. And then there's the biotic things, all the organisms, the plants and the organisms, animals, microbes, uh, insects, that all that are there, uh, and understand their patterns and how they interact, you know, sort of the physical, the, the living, the once living. And then that's still, you're still not done. You still have to understand the people uh, and um, economy and culture and um, and so I think that's when you walk in, you're trying to read the history of the place. You're looking for clues for what's there right now. What does it say about where it was? And try to make a prediction about where the trajectory of where it might be heading. And the, listen to the person who you're with, who's the landowner, saying, here's what I think and what I like. And you try to match all that up to get them what they like in a way that is um, consistent with the, I'll call it the ecological capabilities of the place. Um, and that's, that's the art of the science of forestry, is integrating and um, looking for clues and then putting them together in an intelligent way that's kind of grounded in practical reality. So that a, so that a landowner, in which most of the forests are owned by either the state or by people. Most by family owners. That's a great point to make. We're 75% forested and probably 85% of that is family ownership non-government, non-public, non-industrial, um, non-commercial. It's like family ownership mostly. And so they want to do the best. They want to make the most economical and environmental decisions. They have a lot of reasons for owning their land. We know that for, through lots of surveys and listening to people. Uh, making money is part of it. Most folks will tell you it's a bunch of other things first. Mm -hmm. Privacy, aesthetics, mm -hmm. uh, connection to wildlife, um, recreation and repeated landowner surveys re reflect that they, it's about eight or nine, ten maybe down the list of reasons for owning that they say, and I like making some money too. That said, there's an awful lot of them who, in my own experience, you walk around, I'd say to a landowner, why, what can I, what am I, why am I here? What are, you, what are you interested? Well, I want to know it's healthy. I want to make sure it's good for the, the wildlife. Um, and at some point during the visit, there's a point where they stop and say, well, how much is this tree worth? Mm -hmm. Everybody gets there eventually because yeah. it's real. And the timber is uh, viable and there's, there's real money and, it, and it, it's really the only thing that does pay. Everything else costs. And so t forestry, silviculture, logging, forest products, um, the marketplace that th th results, um, that kind of keeps everything else going in, in the woods, trails, access, paying taxes, uh, being able to hold on to the land, making it available for hunting, fishing, protecting clean water. All of those things cost, timber pays. So in Burlington we get up really exercised when trees, for example City Hall Park, I don't know if you've been following that, when trees are marked cut down or behind our house up in sure. the south end, UVM cut down all these trees, so you know there are not that many of them, so we get quite worked up. But in the woods, I was recently up in Craftsbury or Greensboro in the woods and there were all these trees that were marked. To, it was very swampy, very woodsy, a lot of marked trees that looked like they were coming down and the owner said they were softwood trees. And so tell, sort of tell us about what happens in a situation like that. Why would a person want the softwood trees to come down? Any number of reasons. I don't know this particular one. and. Um, uh, but when you say they've been marked, I'm assuming that there's like some paint on the tree or something designating it for harvest that likely suggests someone's had a thoughtful approach and plan that choosing which ones, that's good. Um, it could be a lot of reasons. Um, and um, generally, uh, there's kind of can I just go back and say I really like your point about the, the trees in your yard and your backyard and in the neighborhood and City Hall. That's what we call community forestry and it's connected to the forest. We think of it as a continuum from the green places where we live to the green places where we play and, and on. Um, there's this, so they're all part of forestry. We have an urban and community forestry program. Some of the essays in the book are about street and sh shade trees and community trees. Um, and it's great when people care enough to say, why are those coming down? And that's, again, emerald ash borer threatens a lot of these planted trees, which were ash. So it's good to have community engagement and people sharing in the responsibility for stewardship of kind of the urban and community landscape. Um, so that seems a little bit more, so we're going to take these trees down maybe because they're a, a threat to property or safety because of some, they're compromised by an insect infestation. And maybe people could 
that's, that's, an, that's a reason and a, and a justification. In the woods, you might say, wow, how do you think about all this? And these happen to be certain softwoods. There are many different species of softwood in our state. Mostly we have species mixes growing and not so many pure stands of one thing. There's certainly some softwood plantations. Um, in this case, I can't say, but I would say this to be helpful, like choices, the silvicultural choices of which trees to keep growing and which trees to remove are generally based on the current condition of trees, uh, generally measuring some sort of risk. Will this tree be here being as good a tree as it is right now or better 20 years from now? If not, I'm going to think about this one being one of the ones that goes away. And when I think about taking this tree away, I'm going to think, if I do, what's going to benefit? Okay, we might make something out of it. And somebody might make some money, and that's good. What else is going to happen? Will these trees around it have more light and be able to expand their crowns and then grow more in diameter and maybe produce more nuts for the animals or produce better firewood faster? Um, that's the idea, is making decisions about groups of trees growing together and their competitive relations and their current vigor and value. And a forester assesses all that through the lens of what did the landowners say they care about out here and what's this place capable of? And then you make these intelligent choices about which trees to take, which trees to leave. And it really, I think, to, to kind of put it, to really oversimplify it, but again, to kind of provide just a helpful framework, generally we're thinking about, am I going to work with what's here and try to maybe take out diseased or compromised trees or trees of low vigor that aren't going to make it anyway and do something with them to better what remains. That's called a thinning or a stand improvement. And the other avenue, broadly, is am I going to start over? And, and maybe this, it's, it's, it's nice, big, mature trees and nothing in the understory and no brushy habitat, save for songbirds, to, to nest in certain kinds. And we want to regenerate this piece of our forest. Mm. That's, so in, as opposed to thinning or tending, that's about regeneration and establishing a no, new cohort of mix of trees, seedlings and saplings to, to come in from underneath. Those are two broad kind of categories of what we think about when deciding which trees to put the paint on for, for removal. So one of the essays you have in here are why it's about why birch trees are white. Some birch trees are white. Yeah. Why is that? It's fun. It's endlessly fascinating to think. Why does that tree look that way? The way things look, we te we're tempted to think there must be a reason, and there probably is. Often it's it can be just because there isn't a reason for it not to look that way. The way selection works uh, in evolution. In the case of white birch or paper birch. It's so white and so distinct. You have to say, like, and beautiful. Like, why? What? Why does that? Why is that the tree? In fairness, there's some other trees that have light bark, um, but nothing like that beautiful white. And uh, the best explanation, if not a direct answer, is that, um, well, it has a, a, a chemical um, called betulin, and that's related to the name of the, the Latin name of the of, of betula for birch. Um, that may have all kinds of physiological roles, but I think the speculation is that if you consider that paper birch is what we call transcontinental in its range, it grows sort of circumpolar all around the globe at a certain at high eleva eleva uh, elevation uh, latitude, and uh, so it's a northern species, uh, and it lives otherwise in cold places, and it's a little counterintuitive, but in a cold place where you whereas you might think well the more light and heat that you can absorb, the better. Not if you spend most of the time in winter where a cloud comes over that sun and it's really cold instantly. This is, in, in, uh, the best guess explanation is that it's white to reflect light away. White is what color our eyes see when all the colors are reflected back. In other words, it's not absorbing anything. Um, and so the tree doesn't want to absorb heat in the winter because if it does and then freezes, it gets at, the cells become active under the bark and then with literally with a cloud passing, the temperature drops back to below zero or whatever and they freeze and they don't want to become active until it's safe to become active again come spring. Mm -hmm. So uh, this idea, basically it's highly reflective and that would seem to suit where they tend to grow um, at these northern latitudes around the planet. And oak trees grow in roughly the same places as birch trees, is that right? Well, they can and often do. You see oak birch in mixtures, um, but not at those sort of that classic northern edge of the range. There's no oaks. If there are any oaks, um, I'd be very surprised and I would guess that they're extremely small little dwarf things and I'm not aware of any. So they, they, don't, they don't really mix at those high latitudes. 
So I guess my question is, if there are other trees up there with the birch, like maybe pine or... There's not much else at okay. those latitudes. Really? Uh, sure, there are okay. some, some uh, softwood trees. Uh, depending on, you know, we're talking uh, northern Canada or, or in Russia or where have you, but uh, uh, the numbers of species that live at those extreme uh, places um, dwindles. There's, we are blessed here with this collision of forest types. We have southern types, northern types, central types. We've got lowlands and uplands and wetlands and drylands. And, uh, so we really have this rich assemblage of species. And we forget that um, on the margins, on the edges of the livable parts of the planet, the species that can hack it um, are very few. And so you're explaining that these birch trees are part of those few species, and this yes. is their ad adaptation so they can hack it. Right. And it also, but they, it doesn't hurt them to live when they live here either. Got it. In fact, it might help them because they're so beloved that maybe people will, you know, plant them, take care of them, and treat them well. So maybe they're white, so people think they're cute. Right. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so why do, when do people know when to tap maple trees? That's another little essay you have. Sure, it's an age-old question. Uh, you know, when's, when's the best time? Well, the best time to tap is, I suppose, when you're ready and when uh, right before the big uh, gushers start or any sap runs. And that's the thing is the timing of sap flow and the initiation, the timing, the uh, extent. It's highly variable, weather dependent, other, de you know, mo soil moisture and other conditions. Um, so it's kind of a, there was this tradition of kind of town meeting March 1st and, um, but as sugaring opportunities expand and there's been some bigger ones, maybe they don't have, they, they have so many acres to cover and trees to tap, um, then they got to get started a little earlier. Um, the issue is you don't want to just go tap early. Uh, forever the concern was if you put holes in the tree and then there's no sap flow for a while those holes will kind of dry up or start to close and or become infected with microorganisms and then that gums up the whole thing. So you want to time it right. You want to be ready to tap and tap just before it starts to, as it's starting to flow. Uh, and you can't really predict that and it does vary um, from year to year and I guess uh, it seems like the tapping in becomes seems like it comes earlier and earlier there are many you're, I would guess that most large-scale sugar makers are tapping in in January or even early January at this point um, and being ready you don't want to miss this great run in, right. in right um, and uh, and with the um, evolution of pipeline and tubing and um, spouts that and drills that are you know, sort of high end and really precise, I think my sense is um, that maybe there's less risk of those other things going sideways, tap hole closure or drying up or microbes because you've got this closed system and you're ready to go. So we didn't, haven't talked about global warming specifically, but what has been the impact of global warming on this Vermont's forests? I mean, the ash borer, it might be an example of that, but sort of yeah. You know, what should we be looking for as stewards of our state? Uh, forests are heavily involved in the whole climate change conversation and really in two ways. One, forests are indeed vulnerable to climate change. Trees can't get up and move. They're built to figure out what's going on and to kind of change with changing weather. And that's fine as long as the changes are within the normal range of their abilities. You have uh, odd rates of change and um, you know, global weirding, uh, the trees maybe not, uh, so examples being storms that are coming, say frost events in spring when the trees thought it was safe to be growing. Uh, changes that they can't keep up with, they're vulnerable to that kind of thing. They're vulnerable to changes in hydrology, we're seeing those things. So they're vulnerable. The other big piece in the climate change uh, conversation is that Forests are also basically our best hope and solution mm -hmm. because they take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and turn it into trees and tree parts and then we turn it into durable wood products uh, that hold carbon. Trees are about half carbon by weight. So it's a really good deal mm -hmm. um, and they're part of the solution. Every study or panel or committee that's ever convened to look at ways to mitigate atmospheric carbon start with keep forest forest. Healthy forests are the, the best thing. Um, and that's so they're vulnerable to these kind of changes and we have to be adaptive to how we expect forests how to work and interact with forests based on climate change um, and we're also wise to keep as much forest forest and healthy and intact because it really is our best hope for mitigating uh, climate change 
So I want to just remind people, Woods Wise, An Exploration of Forest and Forestry. This is a wonderful book. If, you're, if you love the forest, if you're curious about nature, if you're a naturalist, if you're a volunteer forest person. Human. <laughs> a human. You would, this is really interesting. If you're a student, this is just, it's so. great. And the way that you've packaged the information in these short essays is really helpful. And I actually can't wait to read this book as a lover of forest. Wonderful. Forest, I'm a forest bather. There you go. That would be my relationship with the forest. I do forest bathing. So before we close, I just want to say you seem to be a very optimistic person. Um, and you know, the sort of if you really listen to the news, you can become quite despairing of the future sure. of the natural world, but you just seem to have a, a positive outlook. And I wonder what you would um, just say to us in closing about our state and how we can support it to be as healthy as possible. Well, I appreciate that. I hope so. Uh, I think it's important. And uh, I mean, to be clear, I mean, I'm not um, Pollyannish about this. I'm pretty serious and, and can can get bummed out, as bummed out as anyone, and frustrated for sure, and uh, maybe impatient, but uh, I feel it's more productive to just focus on what we can do. And I think to your question about for, for Vermont and where we are, and what, I mean, that's, I think we have reason to be optimistic, because we still have a chance. Um, we enjoy, we are forest strong, I like to say, in mm -hmm. addition to being Vermont strong, a big part of that is being forest strong. We enjoy just these amazing benefits from forests that we don't even really know about. Um, and we still have a chance to keep that going. Uh, I think, and we have a culture of people being forest people and of all kinds, and I think a sense that it takes all kinds and that we can figure that out. And I think we're gonna have to because I think it's kind of our last best hope. Michael Snyder, thank you so much for being with us. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, thanks. We've been talking with Michael Snyder, the author of Woods Wise and also the commissioner of forest Parks and Recreation in the state of Vermont, and we're so glad to have him here, and thank you so much for watching.